Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Harry. I'm going to talk about a concept for unfolding space telescopes. The idea is that you can put a very large telescope, relatively large telescope, into a small box. So you can have a, a cheap launch for a relatively big telescope. Um, uh, something that's small in its launch configuration and bigger when it's used. And uh, so in the context of this meeting today, at the end of my talk, I'll be talking about how that idea would be uh, put into a uh, CubeSat format, and that might have some application for interplanetary missions. <coughs> so a year ago, I think I was the only person working on this project, but now there's three of us, which is great. Uh, in about three or four months' time, there'll be another person too. So we're getting some traction with this. So it's mostly about the ideas at the moment, but there's a little bit of um, work being done to solidify those ideas. In my talk. So I'm going to start off with, um, well, I'm going to start the story at the beginning, basically. So, how I got into this, um, I wasn't thinking about CubeSat mm. at all to begin with. <laughs> I was thinking about very large telescopes that allow us to look for life, signs of life, uh, on planets that are outside of our solar system. So, the question which <clears throat> many people have been uh, asking is how common is life in the universe? At the moment we don't know anything about this. All we know is that there's us. Uh, so it'd be nice to put some constraints on that. So the idea is to look at a hundred uh, exoworths nearby in our solar neighborhood, have a look at them, look to see if they have biosignatures for life. <clears throat> and so, so the question is what kind of telescope do you need to do that? Uh, and the answer is uh, to do that on a time scale of about five years, you need a space telescope because you can't do it from the ground, and you need something where the telescope aperture is at least eight meters across. So, uh, quite a challenge. So, as you can see, I wasn't thinking CubeSat at all at the beginning. Um, so, this next slide just shows some, the results of uh, published by Chris Stark. Uh, so, he's done some very detailed models of whole missions. Uh, and how many exoplanets you can look at the exoplanet yield against how big the telescope is on the x-axis there. And the first thing you see is that um, if you don't, uh, the telescope doesn't unfold. If the telescope simply sim goes inside the rocket <coughs> and is the same size when it's launched as it is when it's used, then it has to fit inside the rocket, so it's somewhere around about four or five meters there on the scale. Uh, and that tells you that you're only going to be able to look at about five or so planets. Right? So that doesn't work. If you want to look at 100, you need, there's no way, there's, there's no question about it. If you want to look at 100 targets and check them out, you need a bigger telescope that will fit inside your book. So unfolding is compulsory. Uh, and then if you go further up the curve to actually, so the, you know, the numbers where you want to be, 50, 100, then you can see that you need something like 13 to 19 meters size telescope to do this. Okay. So this is based on very detailed models of missions, including all of the parameters um, of such a mission. But you can do the same thing in a more simple way by just look, by just saying to yourself, okay, let's think about the stars that we know in the local solar neighborhood. Uh, each one of those stars uh, has a habitable zone in principle, and inside that habitable zone there could be something orbiting. So how if you just look at the, the biggest habitable zones on the sky, the ones that are easy, most easily resolved, um, <coughs> uh, how, big are, how big are they, basically? So this is a distribution of uh, how many there are as a function of annular size on the sky. <laughs> and to, to look at 100 planets, we need to look at 1,000 stars, because only one in 10 stars has an actual planet. So that means you need to go to about... To, the line there on the on the left uh, is where you get to a thousand um, targets, okay. um, and that takes you to 60 million arc seconds on the sky. So you need to be able to resolve a planet and a star that are only 60 million arc seconds. That's an angular size on the sky. And that basically means you need mining telescopes. So a very similar argument, just based on on resolving them, gives you pretty much the same answer. So there's no question about it. We need a big telescope. Uh, and the consensus view on how this will actually be achieved 
is this story here. Basically, this will be done by NASA. They'll lead it. They'll they'll use it as the probably the prime science case for building successor to the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay, so that's a flagship observatory, similar model to Hubble and James Webb. It serves the whole the whole community of the world. Um, serves all the different science aspects, but the uh, exoplanet to life thing is a, a big part of that. Okay, uh, ESA will be part of that, in the same way that, that they have been in Cobble and James Webb. Um, and so they're talking about a concept called Louvois, and that's going to be somewhere between 8 meters and 16 meters across. This is all fine, I'm, I'm happy with all of that. Uh, the last two points though, where I get very disappointed. Um, they're not thinking about launching this for at least 20 years. I think it is, uh, well, I'm impatient, I think that's terrible. Um, and it's going to cost a lot of money. They're already talking about it costing between 2 and 10 million. You know that Hubble and James Webb ended up costing much more than they said it would at the beginning, so um, it's going to cost a huge amount of money. So these last two points here I don't like at all. Uh, if I was an aerospace contractor, then I'm, I'm probably quite com comfortable with that, the idea of a big project that takes a long time to price. But for me, as an aging astronomer, that's not really what I want at all. So I started thinking, oh, okay, this is just the awesome about the, the sort of um, proposals that NASA have come up with. Um, so I came up with an idea how you might do this quicker and cheaper. Uh, so this concept here is, is, is super sharp, which is what my talk's about. Uh, it's a lightweight unfolding space telescope. And what I basically did here was think about what's the biggest size telescope you can fit in an Ariane 6. That's essentially what I did. So this has a, a span across the primary mirror of 24 meters, which is, which is great, because that's big enough to do the project I, uh, I want to do. Uh, so it's huge, it's 50 meters long, 24 meters across the back end. Yeah. But that does unfold from within an Ariane 6 fairly. Okay, and it has a primary mirror, which you can see is not a complete mirror. You don't need all, you don't need mirrors across the whole surface area. You basically just need the, the span of the mirror to, be, to get the resolution. Uh, to make it work as a telescope, you need a metrology system. I suppose so top end there, so that's a system that measures the primary mirror continuously and uh, allows you to make corrections to its alignment because it's lightweight and flimsy and potentially vibrating and so on. And then you have something at the actual focus of the telescope that takes the pictures of it. Okay. Um, okay, so that was the basic idea. Then I realized this idea is actually quite scalable. The idea of something that unfolds into something bigger could also be applied uh, on CubeSat, on CubeSat scales, right? So it's, a, it's scalable all the way from Ariane sizes down to CubeSat sizes. Uh, and this is important because, I mean, the, the whole point is the resolution of a telescope is directly related to how big the telescope is. The bigger the telescope, the more detail. So it has applications for Earth observations, uh, it has applications for interplanetary probes within our solar system, which is what I'm talking about today. Um, it has applications for other astronomical missions, ones which don't require quite a big telescope, but can still help astronomical missions. And it also has the uh, benefit that it, it makes, it gives you higher definition of long weight, which is what is quite, quite a useful feature. Uh, so this, this just shows what, what you might be able to achieve. So these equations, basically, you, can put, you put the numbers in. If you put the numbers that are actually written in the, in the brackets there, then all the terms become 1. So the number at the beginning of the equation is the actual answer. So, for, uh, so we think for a 3U in low Earth orbit, we can get 32 centimeters ground definition. Uh, for a 12U, we probably have something twice as big in terms of the telescope, and therefore we get 16 centimeters on the ground, and for a, a small sat of 50 kilograms, we can 
get it to about 2.5 meters and nine centimeters on the ground. Now this bottom line here is um, NRO uh, spy stuff. This is, this is you know, probably one of those. Um, probably the first one of those too. This is a uh, very high angle resolution, many thousands, tens of thousands of millions of dollars type satellites. A 50 kilograms um, small sat launch is about 1.5. Seven million dollars, way more, uh, way, way uh, cheaper than what the NRO pays. Great, so uh, that's fine if you can make it work. Um, so how do you make it work? You need a very reliable unfolding scheme. Um, so we think that when it unfolds, the initial accuracy has to be around about two or three millimeters. Um, we saw earlier uh, in the antenna, the beautiful antenna talk, Walton gave us, um, they're able to deploy to, the, to less than a millimeter. So, this is the we, we, we think we only need to deploy to uh, three millimeters initially. Because then, after that, we have a different system to get us down to the nanometer level that we need to actually make. So, it's a two stage deployment. So that's a that's a challenge, of course. The second bit, the nano position, is a challenge. Uh, to make that work, we need a very precise metrology system because you need to be able to measure your errors at that level, and then you need actuators that allow you to manipulate the errors at that level, and of course you need very clever software to close the loop and make all that work. So that's what we're developing, uh, and we're doing that at the moment in the lab. Um, then at some point, um, when we've got more money and uh, when we've got good results in the lab, we're going to put one of these in space in the CubeSat in order to demonstrate it. And this technology, as I mentioned, has uh, great potential for um, commercial applications because Earth observations, the Earth observation market is a big market. There are already hundreds of telescopes in space. Uh, so we're actually getting money for this through that route, rather than through the um, <clears throat> And another aim of ours is to actually develop this as a uh, into a CubeSat business, a small SAT business, where we have to sell these systems. And this can have to the business. So how does it work? Um, quickly going through that. So we. On the, or on the far side there, you see the segmented primary mirrors. As I said, it's not filled, you just need a few mirrors that you can span. Uh, if you have, a, on, on the left hand side, you have a metrology system which is at the center of curvature of that mirror, and you can send light from there onto the mirror, it hits the mirror at right angles, comes back, and that returned light that you measure the accuracy of those mirrors. So that, this is a key part of the new idea. James Webb has unfolding mirrors, uh, it has an imaging system, but it doesn't have a control system. So this is a key, key aspect of Supershot. Okay, so here's a picture of what uh, a sparsely filled segment of mirror looks like, and the PSF goes with it. What's important is the, is the size of the core of that PSF. The, the speckles around it don't matter too much. It will affect contrast with the effect. Okay, so in the lab, uh, let me just skip the pictures. In the lab, we've got a set up with a couple of mirrors. So we're doing this with two mirrors to begin with. Um, and because they're spherical mirrors, they have spherical vibrations, so we need some optics to use a sharp image to focus. This is the setup we're running in the lab. Uh, at some point, we're going to get rid of those lenses, which are commercial stuff on the shelf things. And, uh, a better connector to give us a tracking of the images. At some point, so there's the two mirrors I just mentioned. So they're, they're uh, the span here is about 30 centimeters, uh, and they're 75 millimeters of mirrors. And we're going to swap those ones out. The ones that are in the picture will soon we'll swap them out for fully computerized computerized from computer controlled mirrors so we can close the loop. Uh, this is the metrology system that we're 
all the control the systems that we've been using, which gives us an interferogram of the mirror, so we can actually measure the accuracy of the mirror replacement. So um, the fringes here are basically have the weight so um, so we get a very accurate position information from, from this kind of image. Uh, and we're thinking about how we can represent a cube set. So here's a picture of the optics that could be deployed and put into a 3U cube set. I haven't shown in this picture all the other stuff that you need. It doesn't show the communications, the power, the control, the so the panels, etc. But hopefully there's enough space for all that in what's left there. Uh, and that's what it looks like when it's unfolded. I think I'm lucky. So the first thing that came out was the metrology system, then the imaging system comes halfway on. And then it has this rather complicated this concept, a rather complicated dance and uh, I think uh, we need to make this simpler. That's why I'm gonna do that. Um, the idea here is to just show it's just to show that the bits and pieces we need to make the telescope work do actually fit into this box. So uh, there's a lot more work to do to actually uh, turn this into a real design that we would actually launch. But we're getting there. Um, so in my last 35 seconds, I'll summarize. So what I've basically said is we have this idea for an unfolding, lightweight, high definition space telescope that needs to be prototyped. Because in terms of TRL, it's not, it's not very far as the TRL uh, ladder at the moment. We need to be pushed further up before we can turn it into some flies. And we've just started that in Cambridge, as you saw on the map. And, and as part of that process, we're thinking about how we would actually do this as a cube set uh, as the very first demonstration in orbit. And then hopefully, uh, once we've got that working, uh, people will see that it has significant impact uh, in the Earth observation market, we'll be able to sell some of these, but also then it, it can go back to doing what I originally wanted in the first place, which is to do science. So it deals with astronomy, so it's science. So, thanks. Any questions? Uh, I just question about that the, the earth observation usage of this concept because uh, generally speaking uh, with the, the, the ground uh, moving under the sunlight in earth observation you, you need very small uh, intuition time and that's the reason why uh, a sparse pupil like that is, will be probably an issue in terms of flux. How do you intend to cope with that? I've done the calculation. <laughs> or do you plan to have a, 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 a line set control? To, to, oh, yeah. 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 Okay. It doesn't just look at the ground flush. Okay. Oh, yeah, I agree. And I did the calculation. Mm -hmm. I've worked out how an actuator control with such huge structure is. Yes. So, so, so. So, 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 basically, to answer your question in another way, what, what you're saying is it drives how accurately you have to track. Mm -hmm. It drives your point. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, I think this concept is easy to, to apply to. So, we've worked it out to, to uh, universe science and like then so, to, to Earth observation. So, we know what tracking accuracy we need. It's difficult, but. Well, I, it's very challenging, but I really hope you will make it. Uh, I'm wondering, in your idea, so uh, there is a control loop from the light in the metrology system to the tilt of the segment yeah. and back. And during this loop, can you observe or do you need oh, to yeah. stop and no, no, then no. turn off the light? 
No. Next signs. John the line. You can observe it. The two set the two systems work completely independently. You're always looking at your size target while you're closing the loop. So the loop is closed using one wavelet. Laser or something. Okay, so all the other wavelets are your sign. That's how we split that. And then set as you can see from the Control your system is an independent part of the path, so both up of the path of the error are working at the same time. Control your system. <coughs> so you can use a notch filter. So that's quite that's a really important feature. It works while it's closing. Uh, so the XOF version. Uh, super sharp. I know you mentioned it will be scanning along the NIR wavelengths, but what sort of biosignatures would it be able to search for? <coughs> yeah, so the uh, concept is to look for oxygen at uh, 760 nanometers. So it's the A band. In the and That's so the, uh, that was the primary biosignature that I was looking at. Uh, second, what kind of orbit would that require? Uh, that's a good question. Um, L2 is obviously is great, but then there's, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it's absolutely essential. But in order to keep costs down, you might be able to do it. Because uh, um, yeah, obviously, you know, it costs more to go to L2, or you end up with less mass going to L2. So L2 certainly works. The question is whether a lower orbit. Thank you. Any slides? Thank you. Um, I'm not quite familiar with this field, but I'm wondering um, how does TESS satellite from NASA uh, compare to this? Uh, <coughs> well, TESS is, TESS is not trying to resolve the planet in the star. TESS is simply looking for when the planet goes in front of the star. Of light from the star goes to the plane. This is uh, a very different way of looking at it. It's only looking for the planet, it's not looking for the planet. It's simply finding the planet. You can bring a much higher resolution to uh, look for more shiny sensors. For this, uh, yeah, you're actually, for this, you're basically seeing the planet as a separate point of light from the star. Whereas testing is not. Aiming a 